So when I first saw World War Z, I remember thinking, okay, this is pretty fun so far. We've got zombies, we've got Brad Pitt, we've got cool special effects. Oh, a zombie tower, that's neat. Talk about the, uh, <laughs> the Tower of Babel, am I right? Because you, uh, you can't understand them, because they're zombies, and they're all like, grr, arg. <laughs> this movie is awesome. I think because those people were sick. I think they were terminal, and these things could sense it. I think they're spreading a pathogen, and they need a healthy host. What the f Fuck! World War Z is not a good movie, but among its production problems, flat characters, and neck scarves, its biggest problem is that it tries to come off as a smarter film than it is. Brad Pitt is a UN investigator searching for the source of a zombie outbreak that has thrown the world into chaos. He tries to follow the evidence, and though he never finds the source, he notices throughout his travels that the zombies will not attack the terminally ill. He tests his hypothesis, and he successfully uses disease to hide himself from the zombies. See how this series of events follows the scientific method? Additionally, the movie puts in all sorts of smart sounding words to make you believe you're watching a grounded film. Like any virus, once we find its origin, we can develop a vaccine. Mother Nature is a serial killer. Your secretary here says you were his best investigator when you were at the UN. I think they're spreading a pathogen, and they need a healthy host. Though World War Z attempts to sound smart, it could have actually been smart because there are countless examples in nature of real zombies that are victims of mind-controlling pathogens. Pathogens are life forms which cause disease, and many of them turn their hosts into zombies. You're probably most familiar with the Cordyceps fungus as it was heavily featured in Planet Earth and also served as inspiration for the video game The Last of Us. The fungus releases spores into the air and infects insects it lands on. As a specific example, Ophiocordyceps unilateralis infects the minds of ants, causing them to climb as high as they can before the fruiting body of the fungus bursts forth, showering the unsuspecting insects below in deadly spores and infecting any ants in the vicinity. And just like the zombies in World War Z, the rabies virus causes its host to become extremely aggressive, allowing it to transfer to new hosts through the bites of infected animals. The green banded brood sac is a parasitic flatworm that, when eaten by a snail, invades the eye stalks, giving them a pulsing, caterpillar-like appearance. It then affects the snail's behavior, causing it to crawl into open spaces and high branches of trees. The pulsing eye stalks are then irresistible bait for birds, which quickly eat the snail, allowing the green banded brood sac to complete its ultimate goal of inhabiting the digestive tract of the bird. The Lancet liver fluke has a similar life cycle, directing infected ants into places where they can easily be eaten by cattle, their digestive tract being the final home for this parasite. Zombies, therefore, are not science fiction, but are in fact vital stepping stones in the life cycles of many parasites, fungi, and viruses. What could have made World War Z a much better movie is if it had a little less of this... And a lot more of this. Here is a model of the virus and how it attaches to its host. Uh, the blue is virus and the gold is human and the red is the viral attachment protein and the green is its receptor in the human cells. Okay, I know that was boring, but I am serious. Enter Contagion, a 2011 film which is about the outbreak of a deadly and highly contagious pathogen and the aftermath that follows. Contagion and World War Z are remarkably similar films in that both are about a rapidly spreading pathogen and both have plot lines that focus on the investigation of its origin as well as how to stop its spread. I'm going to treat the zombies in World War Z as an infected populace because firstly, they clearly indicate in the film that the cause of the zombie outbreak, or zombification if you will, is transmitted through the blood. It's insinuated near the beginning that the cause must be a virus, and near the end Brad Pitt even calls it a pathogen. They're spreading a pathogen, and they need a healthy host. The pathogen in Contagion is the MEV1 virus. While this virus itself is fictional, there are examples of equally contagious and deadly pathogens capable of threatening global populations, the most famous of which is easily the Spanish flu. Between 1918 and 1920, this virus infected 500 million people across the globe, killing over 50 million. 
It killed more people in 24 weeks than AIDS has in the last 24 years. The MEV1 virus in Contagion racks up similar numbers. World War Z's pathogen is speculated within the film to be a virus. It has to be viral. There is no plausible alternative. But we at least know that it's transmitted through bodily fluids. Brad Pitt cuts the arm off an Israeli soldier who has been bitten, which prevents her from turning into a zombie. Similar to the rabies virus, the pathogen is most likely present in the saliva and blood of the host. So to emphasize the point, and you'll later see why, we're not dealing with magic here. We are talking about some kind of parasite, virus, fungi, or bacteria that takes hold of the host's body, aka a pathogen. The characters treat it as a pathogen. Brad Pitt even calls it a pathogen. They're spreading a pathogen. So I'm going to thusly assume that the zombie virus is a pathogen. Both films deal with the outbreak of a disease and center around the investigation of its source and how to stop it. The difference is, Contagion doesn't just sound smart, it is smart. Contagion is dramatically underappreciated for the lengths it goes to in order to make a scientifically accurate depiction of an epidemic, and it's reflected in how tense the atmosphere in the film is. This scenario really could happen. World War Z, on the other hand, is a really expensive zombie movie that doesn't make any sense. And who best to compare these two on their scientific merits? This looks like a job for... <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. It's sorry. It's, it's a job for me. Almost immediately, we see a large divergence in these movies. In World War Z, Brad Pitt plays a retired UN investigator who is enlisted by the US government to aid a renowned Harvard virologist. Dr. Fazbag is the best chance they have to... First blood. Brad Pitt is the best chance they have to find the source of the zombie outbreak and perhaps find a cure. World War Z follows the investigation of a single person who miraculously finds a way to combat the zombie threat. In reality, scientific breakthroughs can rarely be attributed to single individuals. There are of course the Charles Darwins, the Albert Einsteins, the Niels Bohrs of the world who contribute a great deal to their respective fields, but a majority of the time science is a collaborative effort of sharing discoveries and building upon previous knowledge to advance the field. The first successful polio vaccine was created in 1955 by not one, but five different researchers. It took the team seven years, unlimited access to research spending, and two decades of previous research data to create a viable vaccine. Science is, in most cases, a group effort, where one person's discovery is built upon by future researchers. Reflecting this reality, Contagion follows the efforts of not one, but six different researchers, including an epidemiologist, a CDC representative, an epidemic intelligence service officer, two biologists, and the husband of the index patient. Each of these individuals contribute to discovering the source of the outbreak and creating a vaccine. World War Z, on the other hand, relies on Brad Pitt noticing this homeless guy, this bald child, and the soldier who has something wrong with his leg. Didn't you have a whole team of scientists on the aircraft carrier? Why not put these guys on the case? I mean, even if you just sent one of them into the field, you could- oh right, he shot himself in the face. Both films mention very early on that the pathogen must be a virus. But why a virus? What even is a virus? Viruses are simple forms of life that invade a cell and use its inner machinery to produce copies of itself. Generally speaking, viruses are really just genetic material such as DNA or RNA encased in a protein shell. The protein shell allows the virus to enter the body and invade cells, and the genetic material gives the cell instructions on how to create more copies of the virus. As more copies of the virus are created, Created, typically the cell will burst and die, causing thousands of new virus particles to be released, ready to infect more cells. The nature of the virus life cycle allows it to quickly spread within and between hosts, making it really the only candidate source of disease in these films. All I'm really trying to say here is that if the pathogen in World War Z actually existed, it would have to be a virus. Exactly when and at what rate the events in these movies occur is important because it gives an estimation of the transmission rate of each virus. 
The speed at which a virus spreads is dependent on a few factors, but the most crucial is its mode of transmission, or by what mechanism the virus spreads between hosts. In World War Z, transmission of the virus occurs through the zombie's bite, which we can safely assume means that the virus is either present in the host's saliva, like rabies, or is located in and around the mouth. At any rate, a direct exchange of bodily fluids is required, which is also how HIV, another devastating virus, is transmitted. Some viruses are dependent on carriers to transmit between hosts. West Nile fever, for example, is transmitted through mosquito bites, which makes it particularly difficult to eradicate as its propagation is more or less inevitable. Because in order to prevent the spread of the virus, one would need to stop the spread of all mosquitoes. Species that carry a pathogen capable of infecting humans are known as biological vectors. Throughout human history, biological vectors have been a serious cause of disease. Mosquitoes can cause malaria, West Nile virus, and dengue fever. Rats were responsible for the spreading of the plague throughout Europe, and ticks can carry Lyme disease. Additionally, diseases exclusive to a particular species are sometimes capable of transmitting to new species. This is known as zoonosis. For example, the HIV virus responsible for the AIDS pandemic first made its way into human populations by the consumption of infected primates. HIV's origin is therefore zoonotic. Similarly, the Spanish flu first originated from a type of influenza exclusive to birds, and swine flu was caused from swine influenza jumping into human populations. The reason I mention any of this is because at the end of Contagion, the audience learns how the MEV1 virus made its way into human populations. The audience discovers that the MEV1 virus is zoonotic. The virus came from fruit bats in China. Pigs then became biological vectors for the virus until it eventually made its way into human populations. Contagion then outlines a very realistic scenario for the origin of a virus new to human populations capable of causing widespread disease. We also learn that, like the Spanish flu, the MEV1 virus is airborne and can also transfer between hosts through infected surfaces known as fomites. What's that, fomites? Uh, it refers to transmission from surfaces. This would theoretically make it a significantly more contagious pathogen than the zombie virus in World War Z, which is dependent on direct contact with a new host. But the reason this is not the case is because of the zombie virus's extremely fast incubation period. This is the amount of time between the initial infection of the virus and the first onset of symptoms in the host. Depending on the disease, this can differ from the latency period, which is the time between the initial infection of the virus and when the new host becomes capable of spreading the virus to others. In World War Z, the incubation period and the latency period are synonymous, as the spread of the virus is dependent on the symptoms, aka zombifying the host. It should come as no surprise that the incubation period for the zombie virus is entirely unrealistic. As previously mentioned, the rabies virus which causes aggression in its host, similar to what's seen in World War Z, has an incubation period of months to years in humans. Viruses are not physically capable of causing a 10 second incubation period. The only similarity I can draw from nature would be the venom of a rattlesnake or a platypus, which can begin to affect the host in seconds, but toxins are of course not contagious. Contagion's MEV1 virus also appears to have a matching incubation and latency period, but it takes a much more realistic 48 hours before the host becomes affected. Now that we've determined the mode of transmission, the incubation period, and the latency period, the next question to ask is how quickly the virus will actually spread within a population. When epidemiologists consider the rate of infection, they try to determine how many people a single infected individual will spread the pathogen to. This is known as the basic reproduction number, or R0. For every person who gets sick, how many other people are they likely to infect? So, for seasonal flu, that's usually about one. Smallpox, on the other hand, it's over three. Now, before we had a vaccine, polio spread at a rate between four and six. Now, we call that number the R0. The higher the R0, the faster the virus will spread. It's dependent on several factors, such as, you guessed it, the mode of transmission, the latency period, the incubation period, and how long each host will remain contagious. In contagion, the R0 is determined to be approximately two and grows to four as new strains of the virus develop. This means that at its peak, every individual infected with the MEV1 virus spread it to four new hosts, which is about the same as SARS or influenza. 
Contagion constantly keeps its audience up to date on the number of days passed, as well as the current infected population, which makes it fairly easy to determine the rate of infection. At its peak, the MEV1 virus infected approximately 100 million people in 29 days, meaning that after some boring math stuff, if we assume an R0 of 3, the basic reproduction number per day is approximately 1.9. World War Z, on the other hand, it doesn't bog down its audience with pesky numbers, or, you know, a plot or fucking character development, or any other useful information, and gives virtually no indication of the passage of time, which makes it very difficult to pin down the r naught or the number of infected individuals. Luckily, however, I did find a simulation online that helped me determine the rate of a zombie infection. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, we are doing science here, folks. I'm gonna go ahead and pick the, uh, the zombie virus here. We're gonna go ahead and, uh, name this Brad Pitt. We're gonna start start our virus in India because that's where it kind of started in World War Z. Ooh, India starts a cure for Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt has now been placed on a WHO watch list. I don't think anyone's really surprised about that. Brad Pitt finally killed someone in Afghanistan and now he's turning people into zombies. This guy's kind of a dick actually. They found a cure for Brad Pitt finally and there we have it. Brad Pitt has destroyed humanity. Fantastic. We did it. We destroyed the world. All right, that was fun. Wait, what were we doing here again? Oh, right. So according to this hyper-realistic simulation, the basic reproduction number per day for a zombie apocalypse is approximately 1.05, which means that it had a much lower rate of infection than the MEV1 virus. Although this number is dampened by the slower infection rate towards the end of the simulation, as the zombies ran out of available hosts. There's also a large margin for error here as I'm playing a fucking game and none of this information is actually scientific! They wish to cure us. Each film ends by the main characters discovering a way to combat the virus. Contagion, as you would expect, gets it right. A vaccine is made which eventually eliminates the virus. Vaccines are typically made by two different methods. The first is by growing the virus in a lab environment, killing the virus through heat or formaldehyde, which prevents it from doing any damage, and then injecting the dead virus into a healthy patient. Injecting the dead virus gives the body a chance to identify it as a threat without having to fight off a live infectious virus. If the body ever comes in contact with a living virus, it will immediately recognize it as a threat and destroy it. This is called an inactivated vaccine. In the film, this method is ineffective because the body's immune system still doesn't recognize the dead virus as a threat. We tried using dead virus combined with several adjuvants to boost immune response. And? No protective antibodies, a lot of dead monkeys. So in testing the inactivated vaccine on monkeys, the live virus is still able to kill the hosts. A better method of producing a vaccine is by injecting live virus particles into the patient, which then kills the patient and saves you the trouble of having to cure the disease. This is known as the drunk horse doctor approach. What actually happens is the virus particles are first modified, weakening or eliminating their ability to do any real damage to the body. This greatly increases the chances that the body will recognize the virus as a threat. The virus is modified by growing cultures in an environment with little similarity to the human body, such as a chicken or a frog. As the virus evolves, it will do its best to adapt to the new environment, and in so doing will lose the ability to infect human cells. This weakened virus is then isolated, grown, and injected into humans. This is how an attenuated vaccine is made. The danger is that there is always a chance of the virus reverting to its original deadly strain by mutating within the host. This is why inactivated vaccines are usually attenuated attempted first, while attenuated vaccines are used as a last resort. In Contagion, an attenuated vaccine successfully combats the MEV1 virus, and the crisis draws to a close. Interestingly, the vaccine is administered through nasal spray, which has been shown to be more effective in crossing the blood-brain barrier than intravenous injection. This is relevant because we saw earlier in the film that the MEV1 virus attacks certain areas of the brain. There is a third way to immunize a vulnerable population, which is by finding individuals who are already immune and using their blood to create a serum. However, this method is slow, expensive, and ultimately impractical for immunizing more than just a few people. This method is usually reserved for those with weakened or unresponsive immune systems. World War Z does not solve the zombie crisis using a vaccine. Instead, we learn that they can't because... One of the many things a virus or bacteria needs to thrive is a live host. Functioning circulatory system. I'm afraid it boils down to one simple fact. Can't make a dead person sick. 
So as it turns out, the zombies are literally dead people. They don't need to breathe, they don't need to eat, they're dead. Why can't we make a vaccine? Because of zombie magic, bro! Blimey, Harry, didn't you ever wonder where your mom and dad learned it all? Long walk. You're a wizard, Harry. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not mad that in a horror action movie about zombies, the screenwriters didn't use any scientific precedent. It's a fun action movie, I don't rule out every movie that's unscientific. The problem with World War Z is that it attempts to set itself up in a realistic version of our own world. World War Z portrays itself as a movie that would at least attempt to approach its conclusion in a scientific manner. It should go without saying that a person without a functioning circulatory system is incapable of surviving more than a few minutes as no oxygen is entering the body. Body. And after that, the cells lose all catalytic activity, which is just a fancy science way of saying die. The muscles and nerves cannot function, that's what being dead means. We've stepped away from a pathogen capable of altering behavior, which we've already established exists, and we're throwing that away in favor of dead zombie magic. And if that weren't enough, the movie then doubles down on its colossal fuck-up. I believe these things have a weakness. I have witnessed them literally bypass people. Walk right around them like a river around a rock. Why? I think because those people were sick. I think they were terminal. And these things could sense it. I think they're spreading a pathogen. And they need a healthy host. <laughs> Okay, so do I even need to say anything here? Infecting you with a pathogen cannot give someone a sixth sense of who's healthy and who isn't. If the human body isn't inherently capable of something, it can't be gifted magic powers by a pathogen. Like, are you fucking kidding me here? It's basically down to zombie magic again. In reality, these zombies would be a godsend to hospitals everywhere because you could stick a zombie in every examination room for a quick and easy way to tell if your patient has a terminal illness. And notice that Brad says, They're spreading a pathogen and they need a healthy host. Even as Brad Pitt is peddling the worst eureka moment in the history of cinema, he's still playing it off as if this is a movie about the investigation of a pathogen. There is no pathogen at work here. Pathogens need a living host to function, and despite what he says here, pathogens are more than happy to infect terminal individuals. Sadly, the death of many cancer and AIDS patients are caused by secondary infections such as influenza or streptococcus pneumoniae, which take advantage of the host's weakened immune system. And here's one final reason as to why this is the dumbest ending ever. Oh, so people who are sick are not being attacked? Mm-hmm. There should be like thousands of examples. In America alone? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Rick. Okay, we figured it out. False alarm, Jerry. We do not need you anymore. So... So by the film's own logic, this movie shouldn't even exist. By contrasting these two films, I think it shows just how overrated and underrated these two films are. There are very few movies that are as committed to scientific accuracy and appreciable detail as Contagion. Likewise, there are few movies with so little substance and so much flagrant disregard for the audience's intelligence as World War Z. Despite their similarities, only one succeeds in showing the science of disease. In 2015, Bill Gates was asked in an interview by Vox what he's most afraid of. Uh, I rate the chance of a widespread epidemic far worse than Ebola in my lifetime is well over 50%. If you have any further questions about these movies, please, please leave a comment below and I'll happily discuss it with you. But I think this video is far too long already, so until next time, this has been the Film Herald.